He knows everything about you, right down to the number of hairs on your head. He has not forgotten or forsaken you. God is on time, faithful, and ever-present help in time of need and trouble. Our God is in control. When we know that we have hope in our God, we know that God loves us. And sometimes we need to be reminded that there is someone that loves you. And his name is Jesus. When you feel like quitting, you feel like giving up, you feel like you're alone and you're isolated all by yourself and you're sulking, just remember, God loves you. We know there's free will. There will always be trials either inflicted by this world and the accusers or somehow self-inflicted, knowingly or somehow accidentally. We've all shot ourselves in the foot on an occasion, and most of us have done it more than once. The self-inflicted ones are usually the more painful ones because we like to think that we can control what we do to ourselves. So this morning, our first one in your bulletin on the back with your notes, you have hope because you are forgiven. Come on, somebody. I get excited about that word because I'm here to tell you I never want to be a church that doesn't say God can't forgive you. I don't ever want to be a church. Oh, man, I don't want to ever be here in this pulpit or, or working out in the mission field and not let somebody know that God can forgive you no matter what you've done, where you've been, or where you're at. Our God is capable of erasing your debt and your history. Our God can renew you. I'm tired of hearing that, that talk at churches. And I'm going to say this very carefully. Of we don't want these type of people. We don't need your kind in our church. We don't need your problem sitting in our church. I'm tired of that because guess what? My God is a God who can forgive and change and change the dynamics of a person's life. He can take an addict and make him sober. He can take an addict with alcohol in their hand that can't get rid of it and say, you know what, I can give you something different. Drug dealers, murderers, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter what lifestyle you're living. Our God is capable to forgive. And somebody needs to know that this morning, that we have a church of empty seats that need to be filled, and we may be the only place they can hear the word of God. It doesn't matter your political view. I got a little ashamed when I heard a preacher casting out members because of their political views. We're not going to do that. No, we all have difference of opinions, right? We can change and we can do this. But what we want to know is that God is in control. And the spirit of the living God is here to forgive and forget and change lives. We just want people to walk through the doors so that God can remind them I love you. This world has enough hurt and enough pushback. And denying Jesus is not the answer. I'm sure that Peter was no different in his way of thinking earlier. He had told Jesus pretty much that he would do anything for him. Should I remind us that that's what we said when we were saved? God, I'll do anything for you. No matter where you send me, no matter who you put me in front of, I will do anything to get the message of Jesus out there. John 18 and 10 in the NIV says, Then Simon Peter, who had drew, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off the right ear. Peter loved Jesus and wanted to protect him one minute, willing to die for him. And the next thing you know, he denies that he even knows Jesus at all. Come on, church, think about this. Put yourself in Peter's position. We're going to be tested in the same way. 
One minute we're willing to do anything, but the next minute will we deny him when he gives us an opportunity? This is truth this morning. John 18, 25 through 27, Peter's second and third denials. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there, warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it again, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Talk about the flip-flop here. He did not know if he was coming or going. And poor Peter, he was an emotional train wreck. And you can imagine that he, what he must have been thinking. It is a lot easier to be courageous when the guy who can do everything and anything and knows no limits in this world or the next is standing right next to you. Think about it. It's that easy to be courageous. And I'm sure his entire world is coming apart at the seams, or so he thought. What would he do now without Jesus? He felt like, Jesus, where are you? You said you were the Messiah, and now you have been taken away like any other man. Left us out here on our own. He still did not get it. Again, you can imagine how he felt. He had denied Jesus just like he said he would, and there was nothing Peter could do about it. The whole time Jesus was being persecuted like the others, all he could do was watch from afar, wondering what would happen next. He must have been feeling that guilt, condemnation, like, what is the use? I'm not worthy. I will just quit. I'm sure all kinds of those thoughts were going through his mind over and over. What he did not realize was that Jesus loved him in spite of what he had done and had already forgiven him completely. That's what he did. No matter the circumstances, no matter how bad you think you've done or, or how bad you've messed up or how you keep going down that trail that you're not supposed to, our God can change the directory of what you're going through because he's already said, I promise to forgive you. Jesus had great plans for Peter. He wasn't through with him. It was not the end. It was only the beginning for Peter. Peter had to keep moving forward. In John 12, 1 through 2, you know, that part of it where I'm going fishing, let's look at the rest of that verse in 3 through 4 and 5. The rest of them replied, we're going with you. They went out and got into the boat. They caught nothing that night. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, and they didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to them, good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? I like what the message says like that. Did you catch anything for breakfast? Could you imagine just seeing Jesus? Did you get anything for breakfast? If he came to Harvest Ministry, he would say, I got cake and gravy. <laughs> but they answered no. You see, a lot of times when we don't know what to do, we go back to what we know how to do. Or so we think we know how to do. And sometimes when we do, we influence others to go along with us. Notice through when they returned to what they knew without Jesus being involved in it, they were not successful. Even after they'd given their all, they had no success, not a zilcho, not even one little itty-bitty fish that some of you grandfathers, when you take your grandson fishing and you catch that little perch and you say it was a 10-pound bass, they caught nothing. Now think about that. Sometimes when we get in our way, we get distracted. We get into our personal feelings and our personal emotions. We think we can take care of the problem. They didn't have Jesus with them anymore. We're going to go back to what we know. We're going to go back to fishing. But we're going to do it without Jesus. Nothing was done. Folks, we cannot survive in this world without having Jesus in the mix of our plans. You can't get out 
of the sin. You can't get out of the valley. You can't get out of your desperation. You cannot get out of that brokenness and all those chains and bondage without knowing that you've got to have Jesus. I don't want to be familiar. I want to be intimate. I want to be intimate with God and the Holy Spirit. I want to be anointed under him. I want him to breathe that fresh wind into my life every morning. I don't want to stand on familiar ground. I want holy ground. Jesus can forgive, and that gives me hope. You may think your lost loved one is just not going to turn that corner You may think that lost loved one will never change their mind. I'm here to tell you, I've got hope because Jesus still forgives. I've got a hope that God can change every situation no matter where you're at. That's what God can do. Number two, you have hope because guess what? Jesus has a plan. Sometimes we forget that we were created knowing that God knows exactly what the plans are for us. We forget that that God has a destiny for you, a destined, anointed, authoritative, by the grace of God, plan for your life. Peter had that. But sometimes we lose hope thinking that, what's God going to do with me? I'm dirty, I'm sinful, I'm full of guilt, I'm full of condemnation, I've got stress, I've got everything in my life. What is God going to do with this broken little person? Let me tell you, church, pastors go through the same thing sometimes. Stressed out, worried, things happen. You know, you look at everything that's happened. I've even told you from this pulpit, I had to remind my wife, this is what we preach about. This is what we read about in the Bible. This is what our prayer times are about. We have faith that God has a plan. We cannot give up hope that God is not going to take us through it. But notice what happens after they quit trying to do their own thing and relied on Jesus. Let's look at the scripture, John 21, 6 through 10, again in the message. He said, throw the net off the right side of the boat and see what happens. Now, they've been fishing, you know, I mean, they know what to do. They're fishermen. I'm not a fisherman. I barely caught one fish. I think I caught it at Valley View Mall back in the day when they had those little goldfish and catfish and you could win $20 if you got a catfish or you want a goldfish and you just had to take it home. I think I've caught one perch in my life and I don't even know what it looked like, but I didn't want to touch it. I'm not a fisherman. If I go deep sea fishing, I just get sick. I can't do it. But he said, throw the net off the right side. So here these people are, they know what they're doing, and they did what he said. They listened to Jesus, okay? And all of a sudden, there were so many fish in it, they weren't strong enough to even pull it in. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've caught. Simon Peter joined them and pulled the net on shore. In the message, it tells you that's 153 big fish. If you look in the NIV, the King James, it's a large multitude of fish. And even with all those fish, the net didn't rip. So even when you think you've done something wrong against God and you're not worthy of his goodness to you, you couldn't be farther from the truth. When you do that, you still make it about you and what you have done. That's the opposite of God's grace. It's not about what you do to merit God's goodness and his amazing ability to bless you. It's about what he already did to make it available to you. When you're going through something and you feel like giving up, it's almost like you think you're all alone in your dilemma. Again, Nothing could be farther from the truth. You have made messed up and tried to run away from the trouble. You may have checked out mentally and spiritually. You may have just tuned out and blocked everything out since it was so bad or you messed up. But God hasn't went anywhere. 
He's still right there waiting for you to ask him for help, ready to deliver. Nothing can take you away or stand between you and God's love. There is nothing. You're the one who lets something get between you and God. Not him. He is completely committed to the relationship this morning. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Friends, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that God is, isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you are in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. I'm here to tell you that you've got to get out of the way and allow God to do his plan over your life. Glory is right around the corner. Your blessing is right around the corner. But we need to get out of the way and allow God to move us in the directions we're supposed to go. We've got to allow Jesus to tell us what our next steps are. We lose hope because we put our best foot forward sometimes. And this is the right decision for me and my family and my financial status or my relationship. When, when did we ever stop listening to God to give us that direction? Did God give me the answer? Did God order my footsteps? That's where we fail. But I'm here to tell you, there is hope because God is just waiting on you to stop talking and start listening. Look back to verse 3 of our text. In the last part of that verse, it says they caught nothing that night. And believe me, it's not like they didn't try. You know they were fishing hard. Any good fisherman knows how they try real hard to catch fish. And when there's nothing biting... They have all their little tricks, their little lures, their bait. Move the boat. I would just begin to be sick. This tells us God did not intend for them to return to something familiar because when you return to something you already know, it doesn't require much faith on your part because you already know what to expect. See, familiarity will never stretch you and allow your faith to grow. Jesus said himself, no one pours new wineskin into old wineskins. In John, and I'm sorry, Luke 5, 36 through 39, then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. And also, the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But the new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new for he says the old is better. God wants to take our walk with him to new levels. He wants us to grow in our relationship with him. And as we do, he will reveal more of himself in our walk with him all along the way. Human nature sometimes, it, or should I say almost all the time, fights change that we're not ready for. We like to think the old way is better. That's why the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, rings true with most people. Peter wasn't ready for change and what was happening. And most times, like Peter, we never are ready for change when it's happening. But God was doing a new thing to bring us closer to him. You see, God is always continuing to do new things in all of our lives. He wants to take us to new levels, and, and he wants to show us more of his goodness each day. And the more we rely on him and his goodness, and not our own abilities, the more we realize that he is our power of source instead of ourselves. And when we do, the more miraculous things start to come about in our lives. Look at the scripture in 4 and 6. Then he answered and spake to them, saying, 
This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It is not by might, it is not by power, but it is the spirit of the Lord of hosts. Let me tell you this morning, there is a plan for every single one of us, and it doesn't stop as you age. Sometimes it only gets more. God's plan starts to unravel, and you start seeing another step and another step. And it's not by our human nature. It's not by what we say happens. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that God changes you and leads you. Sometimes we need to stand upon the authority of God and not the authority of others. I can't tell you how many times in my life growing up as a teenager I had pastors come up to me and ministers and leaders and they spoke a word over my life. Now some, the spirit agreed. I felt like I received a word. But there are other times when people began to speak things and I wanted to go tell them, go jump in a river because it didn't agree with me. And I had this one time when a person said, I saw you at the altar and there was a gold halo around you and began to speak this word over my life. And I bought into it. I got influenced like I was with others, like this was familiar ground. And I started buying into what this person was saying. A year later, I figured out that that person did not have Jesus speaking through them. I found myself in a weird, familiar ground that didn't make sense. And I began to sense that what they had spoken in my life was not of God, but it was of personal intentions. And that's where we have to know the anointing of God. We have to have the discernment of the Spirit. We need to know that Jesus is speaking. Pastors told you many times, don't just hear the word that's preached, but make sure you're in tune with the Holy Spirit so that you know it agrees and lines up with the biblical and spiritual principles of God. And I am seeing the influence across social media, through other churches, through other things where people are speaking out and prophesying and saying things. But I'm going to warn you right now, if God is not directing or giving you in the discernment of the Holy Spirit that the word spoken over your life is from him, you better be careful what you're letting in. Because you'll find yourself on familiar ground. Casting your net on the left side of the boat instead of the right side of the boat. And you're going to be wondering why it's not catching fish. And you're going to be wondering why your steps have not been, uh, been influenced by God and, and why things are going so bad. It's because you find yourself in familiar ground. I'm here to tell you more than ever, we need Jesus close to our heart as we possibly can. Speaking and holding out, reminding you that he's the one that gives the orders. For your life not men not social media not ads not medication we get our plan and our orders from God amen, amen. number three you have hope because you are not alone the staggering statistics of what COVID did with people in self-isolation and even our seniors is tremendously astronomical the rate of suicides that happened because teenagers couldn't go to high school and associate with their friends to seniors who had nobody coming to check on them skyrocketed because they felt like they were alone. But let's not just take that into the equation. There are many people that will never know feel so alone that feel like nobody's there for them, nobody cares for them, nobody loves me. I'm stressed out and I like this. But then there's the other type who I'm just going to go to work, mind my business, keep my head down, and I don't want nobody in my life. Now, I've dealt with some of those people before. They cut themselves off. And then when they try to get in a relationship with Jesus, sometimes it's harder because 
Jesus is another person. And Peter thought he was all alone based on his stress, his mentalness, and all these things. He denied Jesus. He did not have any hope. And I'm here to tell you, there is hope for us that we are not alone. How many of you know that Jesus is right there? Amen. He is right there beside you. You don't have to feel alone. You don't have to feel battered. You don't have to feel like you don't have anybody. You can always have a conversation with Jesus. And it can be one-on-one, -on -one, and that's the best part about it. I like having my quiet times. My wife used to make fun of me so bad because I used to go on prayer walks and mowing walks with Jesus. Anybody ever been on a mowing walk with Jesus? You probably don't even know what I'm talking about. One person knows. Two couple people know what I'm talking about. I've talked about this before. I love to get on a lawnmower, tune the world out, and just have a conversation with Jesus. Now, how I've never wrecked a lawnmower, I don't know. That's right, Jesus, that's right. But I have these times, and I would just go on walks, and my wife would just go, you, you're going on a walk with Jesus, aren't you? And I'm going to tell you, I love to have alone time with God because I, I feel like there's that intimacy there, and I think that's what Peter needed at that time. He needed to find a time where he was just by himself with Jesus, but Jesus had to remind him, I've got a plan for you. You're not alone. So God wanted Peter and those who were with him and us as well to know that you can't do it on your own. Come on now. We can't do life by ourselves. He didn't want Peter to do it on his own, and he doesn't expect us to do it either. He wants us to know he will be there every step of the way to help us, always telling us just what we need to throw our nets at or, or just where the power source needs to come from. He has the source for everything we need, church. When he showed up on the scene, everything changed for the better. And it always does. The more Jesus is involved in anything we do, it only gets better. John chapter 21 verse 11 says this, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. You see, Jesus blessed them and, he went and blessed them even better than they thought they were going to be blessed. And not because of what they had done, but because of who he was. Your blessing does not depend on what you do. If it did, you'd never get one. You would toil all night and day to come up with an empty hand every time. We're not so different from Peter. Sometimes we think we're so tough only to find out differently through our own humility. Have you ever heard this quote? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. But reality for a lot of us is when the going gets tough, we find out we ain't as tough as we thought we were. I mean, think about it. That's that humbling experience. As tough as you think you possibly are, we find out that we're not as tough. Sometimes it's not easy completing the task that's been set before us. A lot of people just give up and want to quit when they come up against the difficulties, and they find themselves saying, what is even the use? Their response should be, my God has never failed me yet. It doesn't matter what happens. God is still God. And whatever comes my way, we're going through it together. And I'm going to come out a winner on the other side. Jeremiah 16, 21 says this, Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know mine hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. He has given us his righteousness through his son, Christ Jesus. Everything Jesus has available to him was available to us. That is our relationship with him. 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, Peter wasn't the only man to ever fell short, fall short of the mark. All men fall Great men get up and they keep going. 
The saints are just the sinners who fall down and get back up and keep pressing towards the mark. King David fell from the greatness, even going to the point of murder to get what he wanted. Yet we find him rising from the dust of his failure, shaking himself off, crying out to God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's what David did. Even in his time of failure, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, Lord. Today he would say this, what you see on your screen. I can live without my kingdom. I can live without my children. I can live without my mother and father. I can live without my laptop and my iPad. But I cannot live, out, live without your presence in my life. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine feeling like God is just not a part of my life anymore. I want to feel his presence with me at all times. I want to walk with Jesus every chance I get. When it seems like the accuser and the world are dishing out more than you think you can take, remember this, sometimes people make mistakes but thank God for his grace and his forgiveness. People always tend to look back when times are tough, but God isn't interested in your past. Your past was forgiven when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He is more concerned today with your future, just as he had big plans for Peter. He also has big plans for you. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21 because of the decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah the way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, and a new life begins look at it all this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationship with each other God put the world square with himself through the Messiah giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins God has given us the task of telling everyone that what he is doing we're Christ's representatives God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. How, you ask? In Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so we could be put right with God. Now, that's the message version, but I like that last part. He put the wrong on him so we could have the right. Aren't you thankful for a God who forgives us, who sent his only son to be able to bring you hope this morning? Our last point this morning, you have hope because God will not fail you. When you look at it or you think about the cross of Calvary, know this one thing, Jesus never gave up on us. The Bible says in the midst of his trial, even when he was beaten beyond recognition, he never said a word. So when you think you want to quit, you think about all he did for us so we could be forgiven, it makes our circumstances look so insignificant doesn't it Jesus knows us inside out he understands more than you think he does on your screen you're gonna see this people will fail you family they will fail you friends will fail you your government will fail you you will even fail you Life will sometimes let you down, and the fact remains, God will never fail you. You can count on that blessing. You can count on that hope today. 
You will be let down many times in your life, but guess what? God's not going to be one of them. Luke 1, 37, for no word from God will ever fail. Somebody needs to have that resonate with your prayer today. Somebody needs to accept that from God today. For no word from God will ever fail. He's all the time busy working behind the scenes to get things lined up for us. He's continuing to work out things for our good. When we put our faith and our trust in him, life's going to throw us all types of curveballs. We know that. We, we will, but God will always just take care of those problems. Will there be times of struggle? Absolutely. Times you get tired and feel like quitting? Absolutely. But the Bible says his strength is perfect when our strength is gone. Before the beginning of the world, God knew you, and he's had a plan for your life from the very moment. You've had a plan placed upon your life. The highest calling ever known to mankind, to serve and to know the love and goodness of God. You may have been looked over, passed over, or set aside by this world, but not by God. He actually chose you long before you chose him. You are one of his treasures, one of his most valued possessions. He loves you more than you will ever know. We have hope, church, this morning, no matter the circumstances. This morning, as the piano begins to play with Pastor Austin, you can look at every situation that goes on in our lives. We've called it out, jobs, finances, relationships, family, healing, sickness, our children. There's so many times that we just want to give up. I'm going to tell you right now, as I get older in my age, I get more transparent. There have been many times in ministry that I just wanted to quit, that I was just done. Felt like all my strength was gone. Everything around me, I felt like, what was the use? What's the plan? It's more convenient for me to sit on the sideline and just, you know what? I'll just go with whatever goes. Sometimes we put those thoughts in our mind with jobs, careers, family, relationships. We put those sickness, those things, and we just say, you know what? I'm going to chalk it up as a loss. It is what it is. But God always reminds me, Robbie, I've called you to do great things for me. Don't give up. Don't quit. You know, it was just a couple years ago. I didn't even know where my career was going. And I just began to pray and cry at night. And my wife never knew a bit of it. And I just buried my head in the pillow. And I said, God, I don't know what's next. But I need you. And I cried like a baby. I ain't afraid to admit it. I just cried. And I said, God, I... I'm just going to do whatever you want me to do, but I just, want, I just feel like quitting. I just wanted to run away. And it's at those times God showed up and said, Robbie, this is what I need you to do. And then when you wake up in that morning when he's told you something, you just begin to praise him because you're like, God, why did I ever doubt that you had a plan? Why did I even doubt it? In the times of sickness, when I was sick just a couple years ago now, it's been over a year. You don't think that that thought creeped in my mind that, yeah, this is it. It's just give up, Robbie. You're too sick. You're going to quit. 
I think I even, my mom told me that, that uh, Reggie had talked to my mom because I had preached a sermon that Sunday right before. And he said, did Robbie go to the hospital? I think you told my mom. And it was right after that sermon. Yep, I went straight to the hospital and I was admitted. You better believe the enemy tried to put me down and stomp me and kick me in the head and kick me in the gut. Some of you know what it feels like to be physically punched in the gut. I know what that feels like. You feel knocked out. You feel like there's just nothing left. But Steve, God stepped in and said, Robbie, guess what? Here's the promise and here's the plan. Don't stop. I'm an open book this morning, church, because we are words. Our words of our testimony, they live out, right? And there's some of you right now, as I'm talking, you can relate to what I'm saying. You're struggling right now. You're hurting right now. You need to get out of your seat right now, and you just need to begin to come onto the altar and begin to pray right now. You don't need to wait for an invitation because you need something right now. You need God to remind you that you have hope. If that's you, while I'm talking, get up right now and begin to make your way. Find hope right now in Jesus. We'll have people pray with you. But don't feel like this is the end. No matter where you're at, this is a beginning today of what God wants to do. If you talk to Pastor Robin, you know what she says. I'm just waiting on the testimony. I'm waiting on the testimony. I'm waiting on the testimony. God's coming. But I'm going to tell you right now, she hasn't given up on the plan. That's right. People are coming. Go ahead. You know what you're needing right now. And I need leaders to come right now to begin to pray with them. Come on. I need church leaders right now to begin to pray with them. But if you need hope right now, you need to come right now. You need a miracle right now. You need to come right now. You're on the verge of giving up and quitting right now. Now's the time to come. Don't hide behind the guilt. Don't hide behind the shame. Don't hide behind what people are going to think. This is your opportunity this morning to say, God, I need that wave to crash over me of forgiveness or healing, restoration, whatever the plan is, whatever you want to call me right now to do, I'm going to do it. But if you're sitting there second-guessing yourself right now, that's not of God. That's the enemy trying to distract you right now. That's the enemy trying to distract you right now from receiving the blessing that he wants for you right now. But maybe you're here and your relationship with Jesus is not where it needs to be right now. You've been on familiar ground. Here's the opportunity to come right now. Step out in faith. Find him. Don't hesitate. Come. As they sing this, if you would, anybody that wants to pray, if you just release your hand, towards the altar now for these individuals that need healing as they begin to worship.
Father, Lord, we thank you for your hope. God, we thank you for your forgiveness. God, we thank you for your grace and your compassion. We thank you, Father, Lord, that you've never failed us and you never will. God, we speak for those that are here and those that may watch online. That, Father, Lord, you would bless them. And that, Lord, you would go and intercede and fill those rooms with your presence today. We pray for Pastor Robin right now. That God, you would bring healing and restoration to their bodies right now. That Lord, you would speak right now over them where they're at right now, healing into their bodies. Releasing the pain right now. All the sickness gone in your name, Jesus, right now. Father, for all those prayer requests that have come in online, we pray right now that, Father, Lord, you would intercede for those sick, hurting, and in need right now. We believe it, Lord, that you are able. And we claim it. Let it be done in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you this morning being here. We thank the Lord for meeting with us this morning. We thank him for his presence. This morning we want to give you an opportunity to give in our offering. We have many ways that we give online uh, with our offerings. Uh, you can use the PayPal station. You can use our Tithely app or you can do, as they always say, uh, the old-fashioned way, uh, cash in a check. And it always it does, uh, does a great thing for your bank account and if you don't want to use a bank card. Uh, but we uh, have our Give Online Tithely. Uh, you'll see the address on the screen if you want to mail your check and sew into us as well. And uh, our church offering today is for local church ministries. And if you haven't seen it already, God is doing some exciting new things in our church uh, with our kids ministry, our youth ministry, uh, and our uh, camp, uh, not camp meeting nights. We used to have those. Our church, uh, I can't even think, our family nights. I just call it family nights, our family nights, harvest family nights. We have so many things going on and our women's ministry. So everything you give, you guys are just amazing. This is an amazing church. That's all that matters. We're amazing, amazed all the time uh, by what our church does. And you guys just give so faithfully. So thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. Uh, shake somebody's hand on your way out and we will see you online Wednesday morning. God bless you.